This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. We continue this week with our examination of the Our Father, according to Monsignor Ronald Knox. If you're not familiar with Monsignor Knox, he was a Catholic priest in the early 20th century, in our time most well remembered, I think, for his Knox translation of the Bible, which is a a little easier to read version of sacred scripture compared to the uh, translation of the, you know, the Dewey Rames, which is usually the go-to for traditional Catholics. But the Knox, I find, is for typical normal Bible study is a fine translation, and I think you can get it from Baronius Press. It's one that I like. Anyway, we're going to now continue with his examination of the next part of the Our Father, and that is the line the kingdom of God, thy kingdom become, thy will be done. What do we mean when we say to God, thy kingdom come? Make some attempt to put yourselves back in the mind of our Lord's own contemporaries, and then you will see that the words bear a very obvious sense. Only that sense belongs to a world picture which is not ours, which is not to be reconciled with ours. At the time when our Lord came, his uh, ethnic brethren hopes were running high. Not all of them by any means, but a respectable number of them were waiting, so the phrase went, for the consolation of Israel. Many of the prophets had spoken of a Messiah who was to come, and the prophet Daniel, more definite than the others, had given indications by which the date of that coming might be identified. Those indications pointed to what we call the first century. The Messiah was to overcome the enemies of Israel, who had so long kept the, those people in subjection, and was set up a kingdom of peace and righteousness in which the religion of Israel would come to its own. Was it to be an earthly or a heavenly kingdom? Opinion was perhaps divided, but it is probable that most of our Lord's contemporaries thought of it as a kingdom set up on earth, with the people of that group as a dominating world power. Then St. John the Baptist appeared and told his fellow countrymen that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, urged them to repent, and to purify themselves by baptism, so that they might be worthy to enter into it. A great number of them had welcomed his message and had undergone this ceremony of initiation. Tell such people to pray that God's kingdom might come, and it is not difficult to see what picture would be in their minds. They would pray for a national deliverance, accompanied by a national regeneration. Who would be slow at any time in the world's history to pray for such an event? Men with the outlook of which we have been speaking would accept it as the most natural wish in the world. As we know, a great deal of our Lord's teaching, and especially of that part of which was conveyed by parables, aimed at correcting this false picture. But so far as most of his followers were concerned, it seems to have been a lesson slowly learnt. He had to explain to them that the promises which were revealed to the prophets had reference to two separate kingdoms or, if you will, to a kingdom in two separate senses, complete regeneration of human nature, complete triumph of justice over wrong, a reign of universal peace and universal happiness were not to be expected in the present world order. All that belonged to the future, would be realized when God should see fit to set up a new heaven and a new earth, after the general resurrection of mankind. In the meantime, the kingdom that had been foretold was nothing other than what we mean by the church on earth. It would be a kingdom not confined to that group, but open to their Gentile neighbors as well. It would contain unworthy as well as worthy members. Not all those who boasted its privileges would in fact be predestined to everlasting life. Sin and wrong and scandal would not disappear, yet. And for how long, his hearers eagerly asked, would this temporary dispensation, this imperfect realization of God's kingdom on earth continue? That was a question he never answered. He would have his servants be watchful at all times, and this silence of his meant, you can read it in the epistles to the Thessalonians, or in the second epistle of St. Peter, that the Christians of the first age lived, for the most part, under an hourly anticipation of the last judgment, such as we, after all these centuries of waiting, find it difficult to entertain. To the Christians of the first centuries, then, the prayer, Thy kingdom come, was still a prayer easily intelligible, although they had now learned to think of that kingdom as the experience of a risen life not as a mere vindication of God's justice under earthly conditions. They were a persecuted group living in the midst of a world whose corrupt manners and superstitious beliefs seemed to call, at every moment, for divine interference. 
They prayed that God's kingdom might come, that the strain of all this waiting for deliverance might be relieved, that the visible triumph of worldly power over spiritual truth might be brought to an end, that the cruelty of their persecutors might find its just reward. And there have been later periods in history at which men's minds have returned to the same way of looking at things. The time of the barbarian invasions, for example, or the, great, or the time of the Great Schism in the later Middle Ages, when it seemed as if the church had failed. There had been dark periods when nothing seemed to go right, where misery and crime and degeneracy seemed to go from bad to worse, so that no human solution remained for the world's difficulties. And at such times it was felt that God could not be long in coming now. The existing world order stood self-condemned ripe for the charnel house. New heavens and a new earth were all that a disillusioned humanity could any longer hope for. Like God's kingdom come, it was the only alternative to the devils. But more generally, since the Christian religion first triumphed with Constantine, religion's thought had been occupied with the growth of God's kingdom on earth. Fresh doors of opportunity continued to open before the church. Fresh conquests remained to be consolated. Fresh fields of knowledge to be assimilated. Man's business surely was not just to save his own soul. He had a work to do, a blow to strike in God's cause, let heaven wait till earth had been evangelized. In recent times, I think the devotion to the sacred heart had made use of such language more common. In our own day, the feast of Christ's kingship has canonized it and made it almost official. The mustard tree, destined to spread its branches everywhere, the leaven that must needs energize in a formless, undisciplined world, these are the images that come naturally to our mind when we say, Thy kingdom come. So much evil, we will conquer it. So much ignorance, we will dispel it. So much apathy, we will revitalize it. The kingdom of God surely is something which grows between our hands. Which is the right spirit in which to say the pater noster? Today's events perhaps have contrived to set us wondering again. I think if we could really learn to put God's glory first, and to see human effort for the insignificant thing it is, we should begin to understand that in much doesn't matter what attitude we adopt. God's kingdom here, God's kingdom hereafter, it is all one, which we should pray about. The important thing is that we should be profoundly dissatisfied so long as the world around us remains indifferent, calculating, out of touch with God. The aspiration of this clause for it is an aspiration rather than a prayer or petition, is that God should be all in all, that everything which offends his sight, whether in us or in human affairs at large, should be annihilated, winnowed away like chaff before the majesty of his presence. Intolerable that anything should be done which is not done in God and for God. That is to be the cry of our hearts. How long will he suffer the conflict to continue is no business of ours, it is in his hands. Enough for us that we should renounce in his presence. Every time we come to him in prayer, the idleness or cowardliness which we allow, which allows us to acquiesce while the world remains what it is. If we desire the coming of God's kingdom among mankind in general, we shall desire it naturally in our own individual lives. Each individual Christian soul is a territory which awaits the advent of its conqueror. And here again the same problem repeats itself. When I pray for the coming of God's kingdom in my own soul, ought I to mean that I want to die as soon as possible and be with him? Or ought I to mean that I want space for the amendment of life, that I hope to be able to correct my faults and become altogether more worthy of heaven before death overtakes me? The same problem, and surely it has the same solution. Whether we are to die soon or to live on is no business of ours. It is in God's hands. What is important is that we should be dissatisfied with ourselves, Disown that rebelliousness of the human spirit which mars and defers God's reign in us. Let us live to amend our lives. Let us die at once, so be it in his grace, and offend him no more by sinning. It is all one, if only he will assert his dominion somehow in us. We approach God then as his vassals. We abdicate the puppet sovereignty which we appear to enjoy over our own fortunes. Make over the kingship of them as far as possible for us to him. And then we go further. We abdicate our wills. Thy will be done. His will, not ours. Here is a curious point to reflect on. Our Lord Jesus Christ has given us two great models of prayer. One is the Pater Noster. The other is his own prayer in Gethsemane. And whereas in Gethsemane he begins by asking his heavenly Father to deliver him from the hour of trial, and then adds as if it were a kind of afterthought, Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. In the Pater Noster it is the other way around. He directs us to put God's will in the forefront, for it is our will, this time, that comes in as an afterthought. Let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, just as we are on the point of rising from our knees. 
It looks, doesn't it, as if he's expected of us higher degrees of abnegation than he showed himself. What explanation are we to offer of that? I suppose the answer to be this, that when he prayed in the garden, our Lord wanted us to be able to recognize without fail the completeness of his humanity. He wanted to throw into relief the independence of his human will, lest we should be in doubt whether he had in fact a human will or no. But when we pray, there is no need to emphasize the independence of our human wills. No need, God knows, for that. So our Lord teaches us that before we begin to tell God what we want for ourselves, we should submit ourselves from the very first to what he wants for us. We are so apt to think of resignations to God's will as if it were a kind of second best, as if our first aim in life was to get what we want. And if we can't get that, we must derive a sort of gloomy satisfaction from reflecting that anyhow we have got what he wants. Could there be a more ridiculous perversion of the true order of our image? Imagine being a human lover, a newly married husband, perhaps, who should be continually saying to the woman of his choice, personally, I should prefer to spend the day doing this or that. I would, I think it would be a good thing if we went to this or that place, had our meals at such and such times, but of course, if you have other ideas, I shall be quite content. Would it be possible to describe such a man as being in love? And can we be content with the state of our own souls, as long as we find ourselves, day after day, treating God like that? laying down the law to him, and then magnanimously granting him the liberty, if he wills, to disagree with us. No, the clause, thy will be done, means something very much more than that. Divine love is meant to have the same effect on us as strong human love. It is meant to enthrone God of, instead of self at the center of our affections. And if we have done that, then we shall want God's will in preference to our own. We shall want God's will to be done, and nothing but God's will. Even when God's will for us is precisely what we should have chosen for ourselves, we shall want it because it is his will, not because it is ours. So Our Lady, when the angel reveals to her that she is to become the mother of Christ, does not break out at once into a magnificat over the joy that has befallen her. Be it done unto me according to thy word, is her first thought. She welcomes that amazing message, not for her own sake, but for his. I don't mean to say that the ordinary Christian is like that, that you and I are like that. Most of us have to confess that self-will, disguised in a thousand subtle forms, is the regulating principle of our whole natures. But our Lord is teaching us how we ought to pray, and he is clearing the ground by teaching us to approach God in a spirit worthy of Christians. We only achieve our business as Christians in proportion as God becomes in us that continual center of reference which self wants to be. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Does that mean that God's will will be done on earth only if we pray for it? whereas it will be done in heaven whether we want it or not. I suppose most of us in our childish efforts to construct the meaning of the Pater Noster have had some imagination as that, but the truth is God's will is always done, whether in heaven or on earth. What need was there, then, for the added clause? I think our Lord put it in because he wanted us to see heaven as a diagram, the figure of the blackboard, as it were, which shows us God's will working manifestly, unmistakably, whereas on earth it works secretly, under conditions of mystery, so that we need faith to discern it. A bomb falls from the sky, and some hundreds of human lives, a chance collection of human lives, are lost. It all seems cruel to us and casual, a mass production of calamity. We cannot look behind the scenes and find out for ourselves how it was appropriate, how it worked out in God's scheme, that those particular lives should be brought to an end just then. So it is with the outward circumstance which affect our own fortunes. We cannot lay a finger on the pulse of our own destiny and decide for ourselves how riches or poverty, health or disease, fitted in with the pattern that was chosen for our lives. Our faith tells us that it is so. No sparrow falls to the ground without our Heavenly Father, and we are of more value than many sparrows. We cannot see, must not expect to see, the working of providence. Our contemplation must be set on the heavenly things. There we shall find God's will mirrored in a calm surface, not disturbed and di distorted by the accidents of mortality. God's will is being done, who can doubt it? In heaven, and if we learn to see earth as a small thing in comparison with heaven, we shall find no difficulty in believing that God's will is being done here, too. There is a further reason why it is difficult for us to see God's will being done on earth. On earth the action of human wills, that rebel against his laws or mistake his purpose, appear to thwart his will, to put the machinery of his providence out of gear. Once more we know by faith that it is not so. The action of human wills, even of sinful human wills, does but in fact subserve his ends. He uses the treachery of Judas as the lever of a world's redemption, and all the horrors we have lived through during the last three years are of the same sense, part of his will. 
If we use the lesson aright, good will come out of all the evil, gain out of the loss. But we cannot see that happening. We fret and repine at the seeming triumph of human interests over his. All that will be a scandal to us, and a distraction to our prayer, until we have learned to familiarize ourselves with the thoughts of heaven. Those myriads of blessed spirits, all willingly, freely, the will of God, nothing that but the will of God eternally. We have commented on 24 out of those 25 words which constitute our Lord's Prayer, very nearly half, and still we have not reached any petition that is self-regarding, that makes provision for ourselves. Do we often observe the proportion between God's interests and ours, when we employ self-taught formulas of prayer? But he has given us our model for all time. Let us not be in too great a hurry when we pray to introduce our needs, our ideas about what is best to his divine consideration. Prayer is a conversation between us and God, and when you or I are talking to a human friend, it is not good manners to make ourselves the subject of our conversation all at once. Politeness demands that we should ask after our friend's health, ask what news he or she has had about husband or children, or whatever it may be, before we start complaining about our cold, before we start relating our news. And surely our Lord wants us to observe the same rule, when we are privileged to converse with Almighty God. His interests come first, the hallowing of his name, the coming of his kingdom, the doing of his will. Only then will we pass on to speak of what concerns us, infinitely privileged that he should allow us to speak about it at all. And there you have it. The next time I bring you uh, Monsignor Knox, it will be the analysis uh, and his explanation of the petition of giving us our daily bread. I think his words there are, of course, very wise, that we should focus everything really on the will of God. That is the entire point of that petition. And that how often do we make our prayers mostly about ourselves, proving that we are still children, spiritually speaking. Curious what you thought of this, though? So let me know in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help, as does sharing this on social media. That helps a lot, too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.